I'm Nima Rajan. The Supreme Court of Canada said today that the federal carbon price is entirely constitutional. The High Court decided to uphold the part of the Liberal Climate Change Plan that had been challenged by Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario. Chief Justice Richard Wagner says even one province, if even one province, fails to reduce their emissions, it could greatly impact the rest of the country. The Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act accounts for at least one-third of the emissions Canada aims to cut over the next decade. The Conservatives say the ongoing detention and trials of Canada's two Michaels in China are unacceptable and that the Liberal government should cancel funding to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is urging Justin Trudeau to cancel a $40 million payment to the China-led agency. He says Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig have been held hostage by China for more than two years, arbitrarily detained in apparent retaliation for Canada's arrest of a top Huawei executive at the request of the U.S. Good supplies of COVID-19 vaccines are still expected across Canada, even as the European Union announced new export restrictions this week to keep some vaccines for European use. Prime Minister Trudeau held a phone call last night with the president of the European Commission, and a readout suggests they agree on the importance of rolling out effective vaccines as quickly as possible. Research suggests people who have already been infected with COVID-19 may get more bang for their buck out of just one dose of vaccine. Scientists at Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization are renewing evidence on the protection offered by a single dose. Committee Chair Carolyn Quatan says data from a small study shows the first shot in these situations acts like a booster and turbocharges a person's antibodies, while a second dose of a vaccine could have mild side effects. Hospital treatment for COVID infections doesn't come cheap. Data from the Canadian Institute for Information or Health Information shows COVID-related hospitalizations in Canada cost $23,000 per stay, about four times as much as the average. The average length of stay for a COVID hospitalization in Canada was two weeks. The agency examined data from January to November of 2020, but did not include Quebec. The estimated total cost of COVID-19-related hospitalizations topped 370 million dollars. The Canadian Armed Forces will get moving on vaccinating its members against COVID-19. In a letter to military personnel on Wednesday, Acting Defence Chief Lieutenant General Wayne Eyre says the military is planning to receive 150,000 doses of COVID vaccine over the next three months. General Eyre is strongly encouraging all forces, members, to get vaccinated, saying operational effectiveness depends on it. The cost of elder care is on a sharp rise. A new study commissioned by the Canadian Medical Association predicts costs will nearly double by 2031, reaching close to $60 billion a year. The report expected to add strain on the system as baby boomers, the oldest of whom turned 75 this year, move into an age group linked to higher care needs. The report estimates that 606,000 patients will seek long-term care in 2031, which is up from 380,000 in 2019. B.C. Premier John Horgan says the drug overdose crisis spreads beyond the province's biggest cities and needs to be addressed in every community. The B.C. Coroner Service has reported another monthly record death toll for illicit drug overdoses, with 155 deaths in February, more than twice the number from last February. The opposition Liberals are calling on Horgan's New Democrats to include a focus on addiction and mental health services in their April budget. Manitobans could be able to buy a bottle of wine in neighborhood stores if the provincial government has its way. Premier Brian Pallister says a bill before the legislature would allow the government to enter more or into more liquor selling agreements with private operators. He says the aim is to give customers better service, more points of sale and more convenience. The NDP opposition says such a move would result in the loss of jobs at government run stores and fail to provide any improvement to customers. Ontario's business, healthcare, and industry groups welcomed relief in their new budget for their sectors. Anthony Dale, the CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association, says the group appreciates new funding as hospitals work to maintain stability during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce says it appreciates supports for businesses and funding specifically geared toward the tourism sector, jobs training, and broadband internet. 
It's budget day in both Quebec and Nova Scotia today. Both fiscal plans are expected to be deficit documents because of COVID-19 spending uh, during the pandemic. Nova Scotia's Liberal government is set to table its first fiscal blueprint under new Premier Ian Rankin. All right, up next, we take a deep dive into the world of sex trafficking and how it has evolved during the pandemic. Stay tuned for a special in-depth interview with Miss Amy Storer, intelligence analyst at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. That and more coming up after the break. Sex trafficking has been a reality in North America for decades. But in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, criminal networks have been looking for opportunity to evolve and exploit those who are economically affected. In a Reuters interview, Valiant Ritchie, the head of anti-trafficking at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, said traffickers have adjusted their strategies in sexual exploitation, which has surged online since spring 2020. In December, a New York Times expose revealed connections between sex trafficking and the porn industry after thousands of videos were found on the porn site Pornhub, which contained material featuring child pornography and sexual assault, and videos shot or posted without subject's consent. Multiple lawsuits are ongoing against the porn giant in both Canada and the United States. Over 70 Canadian parliamentarians from all parties are calling for a full-on criminal investigation into Pornhub's parent company, Montreal-based MindGeek. And now a new lawsuit has emerged against another porn giant. X videos by the U.S. National Center on Sexual Exploitation from profiting from sex trafficking, the receipt and distribution of child pornography, and for failing in their duty to report child sexual abuse material. So what steps need to be taken to stop the online world of sex trafficking? Well, joining us now is Miss Amy Storer, intelligence analyst at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and law enforcement liaison at the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative. Welcome to Forum Daily, ma'am. Thank you so much, Nima. I am very excited that you're covering this important topic. Uh, for me, it's something I'm extremely passionate about and gravely concerned considering the massive rise in this crime uh, during COVID. Uh, we've experienced um, a double um, increase, uh, a double the amount increase in human trafficking um, calls for help to the uh, Polaris hotline for human trafficking in the United States. As well, we've had um, an up increase of 98% in ch child online sex enticement reports from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Um, so that is um, a pretty shocking um, statistic there. So you're talking um, really, you know, 98% increase in that same time frame from 2019 data compared to the year 2020. Um, this is a direct correlation between the children stuck at home. Most of the time, the victims are being abused by someone within the home. 78% of child sex um, abuse victims are abused by someone in their home. Now, child exploitation is really um, following into trafficking very quickly. Uh, that connection between child exploitation and human trafficking is very robust. Uh, some studies have shown that 95% of human trafficking victims were sexually abused as children. Um, the reason for this, um, traffickers target runaways. When a child is being sexually abused within the home, they will tend to run away or more likely be lured away. Um, and so we really need to fight uh, the laws to uh, take runaways just as seriously as missing persons. Uh, these predators will actually tell the victims that they're luring from their homes to tell their family or someone that they are running away versus knowing that they would be considered a missing child would be an all hands on deck situation where a lot of resources and law enforcement will be focused to that. Uh, here in America, unfortunately, that is a law that we need to change. And I'm not sure about Canadian law, but uh, runaways are, are the greatest risk for um, trafficking. Um, very sadly, once the schools close down, my greatest fear would be that you would see this big increase, not only in the online uh, world of um, you know, virtual uh, trafficking and child um, sex abuse, but also the fact that um, children do not have an outlet. They don't go to school. They're not able to report to someone. A lot of times teachers will notice something is wrong with a, a poor student and try to report that to someone. And without that, we've really seen a, a terrible increase. Um, I was uh, interviewed by a member of um, Congress about 
uh, you know, what is the enterprise of sex trafficking, the big business model? And, um, you know, what my answer was, was very simple. Um, that would be strip clubs and the porn industry. 70% of uh, human trafficking victims um, in one particular study um, were actually trafficked into the porn industry or strip clubs. Uh, strip clubs are big business for trafficking. Unfortunately, the United States has more strip clubs than any other country in the world, um, a statistic that I'm not proud of. Um, and unfortunately, um, those are really breeding grounds for this, um, this type of activity. All right, uh, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, is, yeah. we do have mm -hmm. to take a quick break, uh, but we will be sure. right back with Ms. Storer to talk a little bit more on the role the porn industry plays in facilitating sex trafficking. So stay tuned for a special segment with Ms. Amy Storer from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security coming up after the break, everyone. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to Forum Daily. I'm here with Ms. Amy Storer, intelligence analyst at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and law enforcement liaison at the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative. And today we're exploring the world of online sex trafficking. Before the break, we spoke about a surge of online sexual exploitation during the pandemic and how social media websites are being used to recruit sex trafficking victims. Now, Ms. Storer, considering that data is regularly collected online, is there anything that can be done by officials to track these data dangerous conversations and to identify cases of sex trafficking online. You know, absolutely, Nima. I certainly wish that these uh, media companies would do a lot more to be proactive um, and actually help us try to um, mitigate this problem. Um, but unfortunately, that is um, not the world that we live in today. So we have, um, we have to basically take whatever we can get. But I really would like to see more pressure placed on these companies to actually alert law enforcement, to actually proactively call. Um, it is actually very hard for us to get records. Um, you know, they require us to have a um, non-disclosure order signed by a judge um, to even respond to a basic subpoena for um, us to be able to get uh, subscriber, basic subscriber data when it relates to child exploitation. Uh, this policy was um, something that recently changed, and it's actually a very um, impediment to our ability to take swift action. Um, finding a judge that is able to sign that uh, will definitely slow us down. Um, otherwise, uh, what Facebook will do is they will um, they will give us that data, but then they're going to tell the bad guy that we're looking at their account, and that will obviously trample our investigation and ability to prosecute. No, um, so we have yes, you, it's terrible. I wish. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see their their testifying at Congress today. Um, I hope that we can really um, put a lot of pressure on them. Uh, one of the latest things that they're talking about doing is having a child only Instagram or Facebook, which will only make the situation much worse. Predators will definitely be targeting those areas. Um, they will definitely be having an easier time of um, getting onto children's accounts. Um, and it's really a numbers game. You know, I think that the problem is they will find um, one person that will fall for it. You know, you know, I've had situations where particular um, child sex traffickers like add the entire middle school at a particular city. They literally add the entire middle school, you know, growing up, um, you know, you would, your parents would tell you, you know, don't talk to strangers, right? Um, but now uh, anybody can access your child with the click of a button. I always tell parents that the greatest danger to your child is that cell phone. Um, definitely need to read your children's messages. Um, children are very vulnerable right now. And unfortunately, the level of um, the level of abuse is very sickening. My biggest concern is not only the level of the amount, um, the massive amount of these predators, but it's also the level of violence that has increased with this. Uh, very, very concerning. Now, in terms of this uh, level of violence, uh, I want to get into uh, the content that could be found on porn websites, in which in some cases can be violent. So how can such videos mentally impact the viewers? Does this in some way contribute yeah. to violent fantasies or encourage this kind of behavior? Absolutely. You know, I think um, child predators have a lot in common with um, serial killers. Um, you know, there's a connection there with, um, unfortunately, bestiality, and, and they typically start with um, abusing animals. Uh, murder um, serial killers do that as well. 
um, and then they move on to um, children, um, unfortunately. So I think for me, what, what I'm really concerned about is, is the level of violence, but also um, we need more enforcement. We need swifter enforcement. We need more prisons. We need more judges. We need more, um, part, you know, we actually need a lot more help from the private sector, particularly uh, these cyber companies that are just making it harder and harder for us um, to, to get the information that we need to take action. Uh, Facebook's policy, which I will slam right now, is that they will, um, obviously I can put in a very urgent request, um, but they say it can only be considered urgent if it's a hands-on offender. Well, if, um, if I talk about doing cocaine every day, what are the odds I'll do cocaine if it's placed in front of me? What are the odds that this, this predator that I'm looking at that talks about wanting to have sex with children uh, will do that action if the child, if he has access to a child. And we don't know that. We do not know if he has access to the child. Um, we certainly hope not. But for me, uh, everything is urgent when it comes to to children being exploited. And, um, you know, I was just working on something uh, right before um, I found another foster child victim. Uh, foster care victims represent um, anywhere from, I think, 60 to 80 percent of child sex trafficking victims. So these vultures, these uh, predators, they they know what they're going after. They know what to look for. They're looking for that wounded deer. They're looking for the vulnerable people. Um, and that is something that is very, very concerning. The U.S. Treasury Department says it has sent out another 37 million economic impact payments over the past week. That brings the total dispersed in the past two weeks to $325 billion U.S. The second batch of payments sent out this week followed an initial 90 million payments made in the week after President Joe Biden signed the $1.9 trillion COVID relief measure on March 11th. The head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention today warned against a vaccine war among nations amid renewed fears that the COVID-19 vaccine shipments to the continent face delays. The center chief was referring to reports that the Serum Institute of India is suspending major exports of the AstraZeneca vaccine in order to meet rising demand at home. Canada is also among countries expecting such shipments from the Serum Institute of India. There is still no movement of a skyscraper-sized cargo ship wedged across Egypt's Suez Canal. The accident continues to delay global shipping today, as at least 150 other vessels needing to pass through the crucial waterway remain idled, waiting for the obstruction to clear. The Evergreen, a Panama-flagged ship, ran aground on Tuesday. The ship's Japanese owner today offered a written apology for the incident, which is affecting billions of dollars worth of cargo. Protesters against last month's military takeover in Myanmar have returned to the streets in large numbers. Today's protests came a day after a silent strike in which people were urged to stay home and businesses to close for the day. An online news service based in eastern Myanmar reported four staff members were detained on Wednesday night, including its publisher and editor. It is the junta's latest attack on press freedom. The Philippine military has ordered more Navy ships to be deployed in the South China Sea, where a Chinese flotilla has swarmed around a disputed reef and ignored Manila's demand to leave the area. Philippine Defense Secretary Deflin Lorenzana has asked about 200 Chinese vessels he described as militia boats to immediately leave. China ignored the call, insisting that it owns the offshore territory and that the vessels were sheltering from rough seas. Vote tallying in Israel has returned, with neither Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu or those determined to topple him gaining a clear path to forming a government. With around 93 percent of the votes counted today, neither the pro-Netanyahu camp nor his highly fragmented opponents gained 61 of the 120 seats in parliament. Mr. Netanyahu and his allies had projected 52 seats compared to 57 held by his opponents. In the middle are two undecided parties, Yemena, a seven-seat nationalist party, and Ram, an Arab Islamist party that won four seats. South Korea's military says North Korea fired two unidentified projectiles into its eastern waters on Thursday. It is reviving testing activity to expand its military capabilities and pressure the Biden administration amid a stalemate in diplomacy. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff say the U.S. and South Korean militaries were analyzing the launches. It didn't immediately say whether weapons were ballistic or how far they flew. 
Two men trapped in vehicles have become the first fatalities of record flooding on Australia's east coast. While rain has eased across New South Wales and southern Queensland, flooding has persisted. Officials say most rivers had peaked by Thursday, but 20,000 people are still evacuated from their homes. Thousands of Venezuelans are seeking shelter in Colombia this week following clashes between Venezuela's military and a Colombian armed group in a community along the nation's shared border. The Colombian government on Wednesday said 3,100 people have moved from Venezuela to Colombia since Sunday in search of protection from the conflict in the border state of a poor Venezuela. Authorities in Colombia have set up eight shelters to host the influx of people. A Georgia man says he was given $915 worth of pennies as a form of payment from his former employer. Andres Flatten left his job at AOK Walker Auto Works in November, but says he had difficulty getting his final check and turned to the Georgia Department of Labor for help. Mr. Flatten says he was shocked to see a pile of oily coins at the end of his driveway. On top of the pile was Mr. Flatten's final pay stub and an explicit parting message. Shop owner Miles Walker says he doesn't remember dropping off the pennies. A Banksy painting honoring Britain's health workers in the coronavirus pandemic has sold for a record $23.2 million U.S. The artwork by the mystery street artist titled Game Changer first appeared on a wall in Southampton General Hospital in May. The black and white picture depicts a young boy sitting on the floor playing with a nurse superhero toy. Auction house Christie's said that proceeds from the sale will be used to fund health organizations and charities across the U.K. The sale price was a world auction record for Banksy. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca. We'll see you next time for a brand new episode of Forum Daily. <laughs>